Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We'd like to welcome those of you who are tuning in online. Welcome to our service today. Uh, you're probably wondering, who's this guy? Um, as it was alluded to earlier, my name is Howie Sellins, and yes, I've spent several years in ministry. I was a student pastor in Jacksonville, Florida for uh, several years, and then in Atlanta, Georgia, and then I had the great idea that I wanted to be a lead pastor of a church, so I moved all the way to New Mexico to do that, and that lasted for a hot minute, and then the YMCA came calling. If those of you are familiar with the song, yes, that is the organization. And so I was there for a couple of years, and then more recently, Southwest Airlines came calling, as I was talking to a few of you in the foyer this morning. Up until March of this year, I was with Southwest Airlines as an in-flight supervisor, and before that, a customer service supervisor. So when people get frustrated or angry, they call a supervisor, they call this guy right here. So I got some stories to tell, if you're willing to listen. Um, there's a picture here, I believe. Uh, we have a picture. These are my uh, people, my folks that I brought with me today. Uh, my son uh, is with me today, and that little one in the middle is here today. My daughter's not here today, and then my wife is here today as well. This picture was taken last year. We were in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, for a week with my sister uh, and her husband and little one. Well, that little one's like 10 now, so not really little, and so that was a lot. That, that's a lot for me to have being the confines of one place for a week. This past year, actually just a few weeks ago, we went with all of my wife's family, her brothers and sisters, and we all, and her dad, and we all went out to Curry Beach, South Carolina, or North Carolina, which is about 25 minutes south of Wilmington. And we had 18 people and kids in one house. So you can imagine uh, the chaos that's there. Now, for us, we flew. I know better than to get into a car with a young kid and a 17-year-old son for that long of a time. My, though my, uh, my wife's brothers and sister, they all drove from Texas to North Carolina. Now, some of you may remember what a road trip is like. You get your snacks, you get the kids, you have plenty of, hopefully, uh, entertainment. Some of you may be of the generation where they didn't have DVD players and musical enter you know, entertainment things in the car. It was coloring books and it was comic books and it was maybe a, a Walkman, you know, for some of you. And some of you are like, what's a Walkman? I don't know what that means. Um, and so for me, it was those sort of things. And we'd all pile in the car. Being from the East Coast, uh, we'd go to Hershey Park if you've ever heard of that, or Six Flags up in New Jersey. Or we'd even go to the beach, which is only a couple of hours, three to four, not like a whole 18 to 19 hours halfway across the country for a road trip. But nonetheless, if you've ever gone on a road trip with kids or grandkids before, even if it's just an hour away, you're not too far into your trip when you hear somebody from the back seat say, are we there yet? Exactly. Are we there yet? So growing up, I would ask that question of my dad. Now, what I meant was, hey, dad, I've eaten all my snacks. Hey, dad, I've drank all my juice. Hey, dad, I've colored enough of my coloring book. I've read enough of my comic book. I played I Spy. Um, I played the license plate game. I've done all that I know how to do. I've taken my nap, okay, and I'm done listening to both sides of my Walkman Frank Sinatra tape on cassette. We should be there. And I remember my dad for a number of years, and I can hear him, you know, right now, he's counting backwards from 10, 10, 9, and he's taking a deep breath, like, what's dad's problem, you know? But it's the same question that I think we pass along the lines from our kids to our grandkids to their kids. Are we there yet? Hey, God, are we there yet? Maybe some of you this morning have been asking him that question more recently, or maybe you've been asking for a long time. Hey, God, I've been loving, I've been faithful, I've been caring, I've been generous, I've been prayerful, giving, I come to church every weekend, I've been as studious of your word. God, I should be there, right? Here's a question this morning. What do you do when you think you should be somewhere by now and you're not? 
when it's taking longer to get to where you think you should be, what do you do in the meantime? For example, maybe some of you are still working in here today, and you're like, hey, God, I've been faithful at my job for the last 10, 15, 20 years, never asked for a raise, or I've been passed over for promotions. I should be at a different seat at the table now. Or, God, I've been coming to church for as long as I know how. This church in particular, and we haven't grown, or we've gone through some changes. We've been faithful. We should be there by now. Or maybe it's your kids or your grandkids. Like, why can't they get it together? Why won't they listen? Or maybe it's your marriage. God, I said I love her or I love him 10, 20, some of you here 50 years ago. Shouldn't our marriage be better than what it was when we first said I do? Maybe it's your health. You've been praying for some ailment or ache or pain to go away for a long time. And it hasn't happened yet. You're not where you used to be, but you're not where you want to be. What do you do in the meantime? Because if we're being honest, Facebook, Instagram, social media, they all say you should be here on this island in Hawaii. Look at our family and our matching T-shirts. Or... You we're in the mountains, or we're backpacking, or we're doing this, or oh, they surprised our family. You know, we surprised grandma and grandpa, or so on and so forth. And look at all the fun that they had. And some of you are wondering, I wish my kids would just show up. I wish they'd surprise me. Your friends say the same thing. Oh, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. Sometimes your family members even chime in and say, you should be having a better life than what you have now. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark today. If you don't have them, they'll be up here on the screen for you. We're going to look at two passages of Scripture today, both involving a storm. Now, I don't know much about Texas. I've only known for when I've been here for the last seven years, but you don't get too many pop-up showers. It seems like it's just hot, hot, and more hot, you know? But being from Florida and Georgia and on the East Coast, especially in Florida, you can time it to your watch every day during the summer. You know when a shower is going to pop up. You know when it's going to happen. You know and can time it. You know it's going to rain. What do you do when you can't plan for a storm? Or when that tornado siren goes off? You know, it could be a clear day here in Texas, and the next thing you know, just out of nowhere, life changes. The weather changes. Mark 4, 35 through 31, this is actually my son's favorite story. Now, he won't tell you this because he probably doesn't remember, but when he was a little boy, he would always ask for this story when we put him in the bed at night. Hey, Dad, can we read the story when Jesus slept in the boat? Yeah, we can do that one. He loves that story. Maybe that's why he sleeps like 20 hours a day now. So that's probably why. He'll be like, no, I don't sleep 20 hours a day. It's 18. Okay, sorry. The day when the e went, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. What kind of storm are you in right now? What kind of waves are breaking over your boat? Maybe for some of you it's a health scare. Maybe for some of you it's a family dynamic. I bet you if I were really honest, and we were to sit down one-on-one, -on -one, how many of you feel like Jesus is sleeping during the greatest storm of your life? 
You feel like he doesn't care? You feel like all those prayers, those earnest moments between you and God, it just sounds like words that bounce off a ceiling. Maybe God isn't letting this storm pass. Maybe he's letting it pass slowly because maybe he's asking you to be still and to be quiet. Maybe he's trying to get your attention. But maybe you're so busy, you can't hear him. And he wants your undivided attention. Why are you so afraid? Do you not trust God? That was his question to the disciples. So I wonder here this morning, what does your storm look like? Because it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. If you flip over just a little bit, Mark 6, 45 through 47 says this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was Patrick Swayze, a ghost. Some of you will get that later on at lunchtime today. That's okay. They cried out because they saw him, and they were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The disciples were doing everything that they knew how to do. They were pushing themselves to the brink of exhaustion. Now, if you're familiar, this lake is close to eight miles in length. So with all their efforts and all their abilities, at their very best, the disciples have only gone, according to the Bible, about halfway. Maybe that's some of you this morning. You are doing your very best to stay afloat. You're straining at the oars, and there's a wind that's coming against you. And with all your strength, and with all your struggle, you're barely hanging on just to make it. God, I've up my daily Bible reading on an average of 18% daily. I've gone through the one-year Bible reading program three times already. God, I'm praying on an average of 23 minutes more a day without falling asleep or getting distracted by my phone. God, I've done all I know how to do. I should be there by now. How many of you have ever said that? But when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out, and they were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And I would think to myself, what did you just say? Why? God, don't you see? I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. God, I don't know where I'm going to get money to pay for groceries or bills or clothes. God, I need a job to provide for my family. God, I'm struggling with an addiction. God, I'm hurting emotionally or physically. God, I'm struggling with anxiety or depression. When is it going to end? God, my wife said she doesn't want to be married anymore. God, I can't retire now because of the economy. God, don't you see what's going on in the world? Why don't you do something? Don't you care about me? I'm terrified, and you're telling me not to be afraid. I imagine that's very real for some of you this morning. There are two words that I want to focus on here for just the last couple of minutes. In verse 51, the Bible says, 
Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Then he climbed into the boat. And if you go just two scripture passages, verses later, it says, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. Now, we don't know how long it took them to get to the other side. The Bible doesn't say. But what it does say is that they did get to the other side. So here's a question this morning as we get ready to wrap up our time. Try to get you out of here for a good lunch today. What did they do to get to the other side? What does your other side look like? One thing I think that we can take away from this passage of Scripture this morning, in both instances, in both storms, they stayed in the boat. Think about it. They stayed in the boat. When their storm came, they just didn't jump out of the water and try to go back. They stayed in the boat. Even though they couldn't see the other side, all they could see were clouds building and waves crashing. I bet you there's someone in here today that feels that they could do a better job of being God than God himself. And we try to do things on our own, have we not? With our own strength, of their own finances, and sometimes we end up making more of a mess of the situation than what we originally started at. Sometimes we get burned out. Sometimes we get frustrated, angry, resentful at God, at the church. Many of you have known people who've done that, and they've left this church probably. People leave it all together. As we wrap up our time this morning, I'm going to ask our uh, piano lady to come back up. As we start to make our way to conclude this morning, I'm going to share something with you. Before we get there, I have a question. Hey, God, are we there yet? When are my finances going to get fixed? When am I going to be out of debt? When's my child going to get healed? When are my grandkids going to come around and see me? When are you going to fix my husband or my wife? When are you going to make this depression or anxiety go away? When's my health going to improve? Hey, God, you healed that person from cancer. Why won't you heal me? When am I going to get a job? I've been asking that question for a little bit of a while now. And it's sometimes it seems like there's no reply. Sometimes you just stare at that ceiling and it just sounds like words just echo off the ceiling. Growing up as a kid, Friday nights were TV night. For me, it was Dukes of Hazard and the Incredible Hulk, the Lou Ferrigno Incredible Hulk, mind you. I was told earlier, he's like, if you know who Lou Ferrigno is, you're too, you're too old, you're too young. And I was like, oh, late 70s, you know, kind of stuff. But that was our, that was my routine. And Jiffy Pop popcorn on the stove, when none of that fancy stuff you got in the fancy microwaves you got now. But that was our routine. And somewhere between the Dukes of Hazard and almost through the Incredible Hulk, I'd fall asleep. Now, magically, Saturday morning, I'd wake up, I'd be in my PJs, and I would think to myself, this is weird. How did I get here? It's because my dad would pick me up and carry me to where I needed to be. And for some of you here this morning, that's all you came to hear, and that's okay, because if you just hang in there, Jesus is going to pick you up and he's going to take you to where you need to be. He's going to take you to that other side. You've been doing everything you can to get there. I've been asking that question recently, what's my other side look like? And I brought a picture of what my other side looks like right now. In this season of my life, that is my other side. 
Now, don't let the one on the left or right fool you. Their smiles are great, but they got a wild side to them. Being a stay-at-home dad uh, to these two guys, it's challenging, but it's been the season of life that God needs me to be in. That is my other side in this season of life. It's also given me, even though I had to go through a storm in my own life, the loss of a job, it's gotten me to this other side, which is a stronger marriage with my wife, a deeper walk with God, a renewed passion for full-time ministry, and being a stay-at-home dad to my son and daughter is the other side. So whatever you're going through, whatever your other side is, stay in the boat, and he will get you to the other side. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close our, come to closing our services this morning, we're so thankful for your word which reminds us that you will always be with us. And even in our greatest amount of strengths that we can exert on our own behalf, God, we're only about halfway there. And if we choose... will allow you to take us to the other side. God, I imagine there's somebody here this morning that is burned out and they are moments away from exhaustion, moments away from giving up, moments away of possibly saying they don't want to be married anymore, they're giving up on a job, giving up on a a family member, just giving up on themselves. I pray, Lord, that you would intervene, you would just grab him by the hand. Maybe you just need to pick him up in your arms. And you just need to take him to the other side. Sometimes, Lord, we don't even know what to do. We don't know how to pray. I pray that your spirit would intervene for those people. I pray that you would Comfort those people who are hurting emotionally or physically and remind them that their prayers are not going unheard. I pray that this church would rally around those people that just need to be loved, need to be reminded that they're not forgotten. I just need to be reminded that you love them. So God, as we come to this time this morning. Let us just take a deep breath and be reminded that you are with us. The Bible says you will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. Come, rest in his arms, and let him carry you to where you need to be. In Jesus' name, amen.